Welcome to the Mock Stars Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Menace, <laughs> and I'm here with the famous, wonderful, and always beautiful Flash. What's up? It's me, Menace. Ah, oh, can we do that again? <laughs> I know you're mocking me, and I hate it. Why you do this to me? Welcome to the show, everybody. This is the Mock Stars Podcast, the number one podcast on the internet for Magic the Gathering and Dr. Pepper. If you'd like to support the show, you can find us on YouTube, where we didn't quite hit our mark. I know the goal after MagicCon was 400, but we're nearly at 350. So thank you all uh, who met me out at MagicCon, who ran into me, who uh, took a Dr. Pepper from me. You are legally and you were legally bound to subscribe. So here you are. And uh, yeah, this is the show. You can also find us on all major podcasting platforms where you can leave us a five-star review uh, to make us look super duper cool. And I just learned that you can leave a comment on Spotify and I will see it and I will get back to you on those things. I didn't realize you could comment on a podcast on Spotify. Are, are there a bunch of comments on Spotify? There's only two, but I've, I've now replied to them. Reply to them both. You can also support us via Patreon, where you can become an official Pepperhead for three dollars a month. You can be support the show and get a an entry into each of our biweekly giveaways. You can also become a Cherry Vanilla Pepperhead, like Will Rule, K Mister K, UWP Quirt, D Mun eighty two, Tommy Cipher, Jacob Hibbard, The Boogie Ghost, Pool Boy Barry, Draw for Turn, KB, and our newest patron, Jeremy who came out to see us at MagicCon, got a set of tokens, played a couple games, and uh, I am still reeling from the Alexios game. So it pains me. It was so fast, so quick. All right. Flash, I know you weren't there with me, but a lot happened to MagicCon. I'm not sure if you were had your, your ear to the ground listening for the, the buffalo of announcements that came our way but uh the buffalo of announcements yeah uh, you know like you put your ear to the ground and you hear the the the, the buffalo coming from in the, in the distance the rumbling yeah the yeah rumbling of the hooves yeah yeah um, that was where i was going what with was that the thing that you said a couple episodes ago about like all the tiny bones in your face or whatever <laughs> you know what i'm talking about <laughs> Anyway, uh, <laughs> no yeah, no. So MagicCon, right? Yeah, yeah. In, I'm proving Keep on that camera in. that I was at MagicCon. I'm wearing the Windbreaker that they were selling at the convention. It's actually super sick. It's beautiful. Anyway, can I, I? I don't have video right now. Can you describe this Windbreaker? Uh, yeah. So it is um, a Duskborn Magic the Gathering Windbreaker, and uh, it's like spooky purple on top and then it actually transitions into a spooky green at the bottom so it's like a gradient okay yeah yeah and it has like the magic the gathering uh logo embroidered on the left lapel area with a like an imp with a lightning bolt and then on the back it has fibble thip like scared in front of this mansion scary scary mansion so yeah it's pretty sweet. Uh, Magicon. I realized after Magicon that, you know, all the things we're about to talk about today, this might be a little bit of a somber episode as we move forward. Just because uh, thinking about all the things and how they happened, I'm not quite sure if I can reflect on them in an entirely positive manner. Some of these things might come off as negative or uh, skeptical or pessimistic. If I were to just put on this face every day and, and be the content creator that's happy and ha you know happy-go-lucky, whatever, I, just, I wouldn't be giving you the most authentic menace that uh, I could be. So uh, here we go. Let's give it a shot. A lot of things. Lots of announcements. I did party on Friday night, which was crazy. By the way, that remember that Halloween party that was that was happening? That, oof, I remember it with all the tiny little bones in my face or whatever. I don't remember saying that. 
<laughs> I don't know. If anyone knows what I'm talking about, please put it in the comments. Yeah, we need a we need a refresh on that, or I'm gonna have to go back and listen to the last two episodes. Might you know what? Honestly, might not have even made it into the episode. <laughs> yeah, it could have just yeah, been like a sidebar. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So but that anyway. Yeah, that Halloween. Yeah, that Halloween Good party transition. happened. Yeah. It's all in. So story time. It was Friday night. I had no idea that the I thought the Halloween party was supposed to be on Saturday at Magicon. So Friday night rolls around and I'm planning to go to uh this vintage draft, which someone had invited me to. And uh they yeah, they have their own chapel uh, or channel. It's a it's a popper channel. I'll try to remember it and put it in the description below. But they invited me to this vintage like draft where or a cube draft. And I was like super excited to go do that. And then they're like, you you can come unless you're like going to that party thing tonight. And then it reminded me. And I was like, yeah, I'm not missing out on the open bar. So went to the party. As I'm walking in, um, walking in with CGB. If you know who that is. Yeah. Covert Go Blue. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, 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 I watch arena content pretty regularly and I like I saw him and I was like yo CGB you're a legend man and he hit me with like the uh <laughs> the catch the catchphrase and he goes thanks dude you're cool and I <laughs> was like oh my god barf but I got inside and after a couple a couple of drinks I was really feeling it. it was a great party the dancing was awesome the at the vibes were immaculate everyone with their halloween costumes and they had like a a costume contest like halfway through it was it was awesome and then i just remember like dancing at one point and i look up and someone's tapping me on the shoulder because and then I, they're like look down i have a foot on somebody's dress on accident and i was like oh my god i'm so sorry and then i look up and i'm apologizing to voxy <laughs> who I was dancing next to for like 45 minutes. And then I look beyond her and CGB is out of his mind head banging. <laughs> it was like, it was like this really surreal moment where all these content creators that I'd like, I, I know and watch and follow were just like letting loose. So it was like, it was a party for all and it was, it was pretty rad and I hope they do something like that again next year. But Next year, they're not doing it around Halloween. They're doing it in July in Vegas, I think. That's my story. I'm sticking to it, Flash. It was fun. Anything? <laughs> Sorry, I just sneezed. Hopefully that was not on mic. <laughs> yeah. All right. Announcements. Magicon was crazy. It was cool. There were a lot of fun things that happened. But if you weren't there, uh, it's really hard to explain those things as, uh, as proof of my story. So uh, there were a few announcements that pertain to you, the everyday magic player, that make... Uh, well, has created some drama, right? For as, me, the everyday magic player? Yeah. Yeah, this is very dramatic for you, Flash. Are you ready for this announcement? Uh I, I I wasn't ready for it, and my life has been in turmoil ever since it was announced. Yeah. SpongeBob SquarePants is getting its own secret layer. Likely mechanically unique. We don't know anything about this set until the leaks start happening, but it is coming. Whether you like it or not, I think that was way, you know the fear that everybody had initially when Universes Beyond started was that you would have SpongeBob in the mix with, you know, The Walking Dead with, uh, you know, now Assassin's Creed with a few other things. So these are, yeah, like I said, likely mechanically unique, but it is a single drop coming in 2025. How do you feel, Flash, about SpongeBob? Uh, about the character of SpongeBob? Exactly. Uh, about, my, about my close personal friend, Patrick Starfish. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like mostly on this podcast, we talk about Magic Gathering, Dr. Pepper, 
um, the tiny bones in your face or whatever. And then uh, Don Cheadle magic Don Cheadle. And then how magic is. Oh, did we plug the tokens Um, tokens? We have tokens. It kills me every time I forget. uh, Yeah. Okay. As long as we mention the tiny bones in your face or whatever, uh, that's good. (laughs) So anyway, we in previous episodes, we've definitely talked about uh, how this is magic is just becoming Fortnite. Like everything's just becoming Fortnite, ready player one. And that's just is what it is. Yeah. Uh, And for a while, the executives at Wizards were just like, no, that's not really it. That's not it. It, This is different stuff. This is just like you could ignore it if you don't like it. It's whatever. Um, But now all this stuff is standard legal. It is just definitely part of the thing. And uh, yeah, it, it's fully Fortnite, fully ready player one. Yeah. And so that is part of the, the next announcement is that all of the tent pole sets that we will be seeing in the file in the upcoming year, 2025, will be standard legal. So all of these secret layer drops, they're not standard legal. Thank God. So the things that are standard legal will be the Final Fantasy set and they're doing a Spider-Man set as well. So I you know there's a lot to talk about here with this, but before I do that, I just want to remind you that this is the Mock Stars podcast, the number one podcast on the internet for Magic the Gathering and Dr. Pepper, and you and I forgot to do at the top of the show. I forgot to mention that Reven Lift is hanging out in the Dr. Pepper Mock Stars Lounge. And Yeah, did did um did Ravenlift get their hat? The hat is in the hats. mail. Hats. Hats, okay. multiple, plural, are in the mail. Cool. Did the other Patreon subscribers get a shout out? <laughs> I forget. Yes, they did. Yes. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. But Ravenlift. How was how was hanging out with Lola Bunny this week? You let us know. I heard she was there. All right. Plenty of things to talk about here. The thing that I then the point that I want to make with universes beyond becoming standard legal is a broader projection of <laughs> Magic the Gathering as a whole as it moves forward. And this is going to sound a little like a conspiracy theory in a, in a sense. So take it with a grain of salt because this might not be what happens. This might not be the future of the game. But with the idea that tentpole sets like, you know, Final Fantasy and Spider-Man can are now standard legal. Oh, man, we oh, it was obviously a, a very slippery slope before with a lot of the universes beyond stuff. But now this is, uh, and, you know, I'm not like being a doomsday or anything like that, but this is screaming to me that Wizards of the Coast has lost its sense of identity. That it no longer has confidence in its own brand or that Hasbro has said, hey, look at the universe's beyond sales. Look how successful they are. Look at and compare them to the sales of your own stuff. Like, I don't know, all will be one, a notoriously poor like set set that did not sell well uh, versus, you know, like blah, this blah, that our sales are bigger. So you should be doing this. You should be printing these things because Lord of the Rings sold incredibly well. It is outperforming your own brand. So you should be doing this more. We encourage you to do this more, but uh, now we're seeing Aether drift, which is coming at the very front of 2025 and I hate to say it, but we're going to get a Hot Wheels secret layer drop with alongside this. And that's not even official. This is just a prediction. Because when I saw the cards that were spoiled from Aether Drift, they looked a lot like Hot Wheels. And you know who owns Hot Wheels? Mattel. And you know who owns Mattel? Hasbro. So it's just, it's seeming You know that- who owns Hasbro? Halliburton KBR. Is that is that true? No, maybe, <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, uh, we'll 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 get back to you guys on that. We we got to figure out who owns Hasbro. 
But uh, actually, I just looked it up. It's Northrop Grumman's. I, 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 you just, I don't even know who that is. A collective. Uh, I, I, I'm naming military defense contractors. Oh, heard. <laughs> That's dark. All right. <laughs> the thing, the thing, in the point that I'm, I guess I'm trying to get to is that the magic world that you once knew that had uh, immersive creative worlds that existed have uh, now become this playground for it's looking a lot like space jam 2 our favorite movie of all time something we know intimately well so i say what you will about space jam 2 it is a movie of all time a movie of all time and it, it it was warner brothers opportunity to splash and mingle all of their ips under one sun in a span of about 90 minutes including don Cheadle as algae rhythm and LeBron James's fake family. So, and there was some, there was a story, a story happened in that movie, but th- essentially it's the same thing, right? We talk about Fortniteification. I, you know, we have Tarkir Dragonstorm coming in April and then in August, Edge of Eternities. But the things that stand out the most, while these are three magic IPs, hopefully, fingers crossed, the standouts are Final Fantasy and Spider-Man due to the news that they're going to be standard legal. There's no... They're erasing the line, right? There was a line between these IPs and magic IPs. You know, it was that magic was magic and mag- magic sets and cards were standard were tournament legal and these ones were not unless you know it was a eternal format like legacy commander whatever now we have to worry about rotation with peter parker and rotation with with cloud and sephiroth uh, i don't know what the future looks like uh any concerns with that flash uh about the future yeah you know the future as it pertains to Space Jam 2 and the Fortniteification of of magic. Uh I mean it, it just is what it is. Like I don't it's there's no undoing it. There's going to be you know what I mean? Right. Absolutely. The th- just the future is here. We're here. We're in it. Yeah. Um the future is but, now. So I guess uh yeah. Yeah, we're just in it, man. Like uh if you want to play competitive magic like you're gonna have to play Peter Parker's web shooters. Yeah. You know, it, <laughs> it's, it's an auto include. Like Aunt May is gonna be OP. Like Aunt May's wheat cakes, like just so OP. Um, and you're just gonna have to play Aunt May's wheat cakes. Oh, and we're sponsored by the Rand Corporation. We are? Yeah, uh, another <laughs> I think that's a Vietnam War era. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, we're off the rails. Just as just as magic is. Um, all right, just so everyone is aware, uh, I did play plenty of games with Indoraptor, and I got a win. I won one game out of the. I think I played like six games with it. <laughs> but I got a win, Flash. Aren't you proud of me? So proud of you. Oh, thanks, dude. The incredible one incredible that- conversion rate. Uh, hey. It's 18%. Thank you. The The big thing that I learned over the course of Magicon and playing games was that Rogsai is in a different tier. Like, it is tier zero and nothing stands close to it. Like, I think that there could be a banning of Rograk that would help balance the format even more. But, again, uh, like it's one of those things. Free spells... Having access, having access to fierce guardianship and deflecting SWAT and like flare of duplication and stuff like that right off the bat is disgusting. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of pods or you see a lot of tournament results where like the top four or like three rog size and you know Kinnon or two rogs and two Kinnons. Like that that's 
says a lot about like the meta is, and where we're at is like Kinnon is really, really strong, very strong, grindy engine that can like persevere through combos and weave in and out. And then Rogsai, which is just like this head full of steam, like running downhill like type combo machine. Um, I watched it, you know, I literally the the rock side deck that I built had a turn turn two win uh, at LobbyCon, and it was it was gross. I tried interacting with it, and they had a pact in their hand, so it was like <laughs> it's like nope, nope. Uh, game's over. Shuffle up. I'm leaving. That left a sour taste in my mouth. So yeah, rock rack very good right now, and I think. Rog- is it is it in the same tier as Indoraptor? I think it might just be a tier below, but it, it, to be determined, we'll see the results soon enough. I'm sure. So, alongside all these announcements for SpongeBob and Universe Beyond becoming standard legal, we have a few other things that happened as well. Uh, there is a change in how combat damage happens in the world of magic as well. So a uh, slight ruling change to that. And I've watched a few videos so that hopefully I can explain it to you, the listener, is essentially that uh, the change in combat damage is going to be a reordering of steps that help or give, give advantage to the attacker rather than giving the uh, defender the advantage on something. So combat tricks become less effective, but essentially when you declare your attacks, like priority happens, right? Or before attackers priority, attacks declared priority, uh, blockers declared. And usually at the blockers declared part is where you would assign damage. So you sink, you swing in with a six, six and they block with two, two, three, threes or a, uh, three, three and a five, five, let's say, right. And at that point you, or you order which one you will hit first and which one you will hit second. Most of the time in the way that we used to do it was that you would put the five, five up front. So you would at least remove that creature, the large, the larger threat, and then have the three, three on the backside. But now there is no ordering of damage. The attacker does not have to reveal that information. Basically, instead of choosing to assign damage before damage, you are, or once once blockers are declared, once blocks are declared, spells are cast, then you assign the damage. It's done instantly, and there is no way to respond to it. So it, it, it creates, yeah, an, an advantage for attackers and... Unless, you know, like you want to make a creature indestructible or whatever, you know, that's kind of like, it, it's a very, it's a very lopsided in the favor of the offensive player, like change. Did they say why they made this change? Not exactly. I'm guessing it's because there's design space that wants to be navigated, but or, or, or I don't know, understand the imbalance that existed before to, as, as to why they wanted to make this change, but um, we're... Yeah, was this anticipated at all, that this was going to happen? Or is this just like a random thing? It, no, I, I I didn't anticipate it. I didn't know it was coming. And it, okay. at Magicon, I feel like it just kind of like threw everybody, where it was like, why? You know, this is something that has existed this way for a long time. We're just, you know, and... Um, I think we're, we'll have more insight on it. Are there? In the future. Is, is does this somehow make the combat more like Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon or like other popular card games, where it's just oh, you know, removes an intricacy from Magic? No, I don't think it like. Okay. I don't. I don't think it likens itself to any other card game that currently exists. Um. So it, it's it it is just one of those things where you just sit and you wonder. Does Why? it make it easier for new players? Like, what does what does this accomplish? Yeah, it, that's that's what we're all wondering. So, because it has like it will change all of the programming that currently exists on Arena. It will like you know this is something that has been thought about in the you know in the boardroom for quite some time, and now the change is being made. 
and they must be prepared for it or some of the sets that are coming up are like you know gonna have text that is written to accommodate for this new rule change I, I i'm not sure and i don't know exactly what it changes other than removing like the effects of combat dan- or like the like combat tricks become less effective so yeah All of us are still scratching our heads. If you know, if you're out there listening to this and you know what the advantage is or what advantage you can glean from from this rule change is, let us know in the comments. I'm not quite sure. I'm a little scared. (laughs) But not not terribly. It's, um, yeah, it's a little more confusing than anything. All right. Alongside the announcement for combat damage changing all throughout the weekend we were shown new cards from foundations this is where a lot of these rule changes were also happening in regards to that uh so we have a lot of new cards from foundations all new stuff very exciting not all new stuff but a lot of new cards a lot of old cards the set i think it's an intention in its intention was designed originally announced that its design was meant to uh, give players uh, reprints of cards that are highly desired, but also cards that are going to help balance standard out. Now, that sentence sounds like it came with a lot of great intentions, but again, we are here uh, with a lot of new cards a lot of really powerful cards and I don't quite know how to take it. So uh, very early on, we were given land war elves as like, this is like very early on long time ago, a couple months ago, we were shown land war elves is going to be reprinted into standard, which uh, I think a year ago, they said they were not going to put a one mana mana dork back into standard, like unconditional mana dork. But, um, Land War Elves is coming back, and then a few rares and a few old classic cards like Ajani, Caller of the Pride, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, Vivian Reed is coming back. Jazal Goldmane will be in standard. Uh, Savannah Lions will be in standard. Omniscience is coming back. Uh, but along to- alongside those, we're also getting some new cards like Kaido, Cunning Infiltrator, uh, which is a three mana. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, put a loyalty counter on Kaito. So new ways to proc loyalty gain with uh, Planeswalkers is here. Another ninja card that I think is still viable. I'm not sure. The thing is about this, I'm not sure that any of these cards are quite CDH viable yet. Like, we will see. (laughs) But yeah, there's there's quite a cool new there's quite a few new cool cards, legendary creatures that we'll all be able to make decks around or include in the ninety nine. Like we have our second ever version of Arabo, the first Fang, two and a white cat avatar two two that says other cats you control get plus one plus one whenever Arabo or another non token cat you control enters, create a one one white cat creature token, and then oh sorry. I spoke too soon. We have Niv Mizzet Visionary. Have you seen this one yet, Flash? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, a, a six mana dragon wizard, four a blue and a red, so far less mana restrictive than Niv Mizzet Perun. But it is a five five flying. You have no maximum hand size. Whenever a source you control deals non combat damage to an opponent, you draw that many cards. Wow, 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 you wow. That's pretty good. That's good. Yeah, it notably combos with all other versions of Niv Mizzet as well. So, uh, whenever you draw a card, deal a damage, blah, 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 you draw your entire deck and hopefully you kill everybody in the process. So, I think this one actually will be tested. People will figure out if it's CDH viable or not. It just doesn't have those really pretty words on it. Ward, sacrifice your entire board, you know, or hexproof. 
or Shroud or anything like that. So we'll see what the future of Niv Mizzet is. Obviously, very, very strong, right? I think that's incredible, like an incredible effect. Uh, but it, yeah, seems seems a little pushed as well. Uh, Progenitus is back in standard. Let's see. We have a, a, a another Twin Flame Electro Duplicate that can be cast from the graveyard. So Tuna Red, create a token that's a copy of target creature you control, except it has haste and sacrifice it at, uh, sacrifice it at the end step. So, uh, but it has flashback two and two red. I think this has potential to be uh, a. Uh, this has potential to be part of an intuition stack. I think, where it includes like dual caster. Um, so this dual caster and Savine's wreck would be pretty. I don't know. Actually, maybe cosmic rebirth. Uh, anyway, uh, enough mana, and you can pretty much do anything with intuition, but uh, this basically creates a, a situation where it doesn't matter what you choose, uh, you know, in this because this can be cast from the graveyard. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, Twin Flame and Dual Caster Mage is a, com a combination of cards that usually ends the game, so this has the potential for that. Some more cards from Foundations that are actually kind of crazy. We have, one, a reprint of Authority of the Consoles. Thank God that card put in work this weekend. Which, by the way, Shaline Halar, more viable than it was pre-ban. Like, I got so many games in with Shaline Halar this weekend that, like, it just reinforces this idea that the deck can, can still compete and uh, can just kind of come out of nowhere and present win conditions cons like consistently. So I I'm pretty excited about that. Um, there is a new equipment. That is what I'm looking for. It is a Leyline Axe. It is incredible. It is a four mana artifact that says, if this card is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one. It has double strike and trample. You can equip it for three mana. That is gross. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why they think na like now is the time to bring back ley lines in there. And with it, just, they just don't feel balanced at the moment, considering that they're going to ban one in standard. Um, it, it's, this is Ember Cleave for three mana. If you're able to, have it in your opening hand uh, there was some uh there were there was a statistic out there because uh ley line of resonance is the red ley line from this past set that has been turning a lot of heads in standard it hasn't quite seen a physical ban but it got banned on arena because if you start the game with it in your hand it comes onto the battlefield and then it says whenever you cast a spell that targets only a creature you control, you may copy it, choose new targets for the copy. So things like Monstrous Rage go crazy with it. So you double that effect. And so Ley Lines, basically, if you have four, a four of in your library uh, and you go for your opening hand, there's something like over a 50% chance that you will end up with one in your hand to start the game, which was like, I was like, what? And then I've been seeing it all over Arena. And basically, if you start the game before it got banned, but before, as you would start the game, pretty much everybody you would play against would just have a resonance in play almost immediately. And it's it's a hand that you just can't turn away because it's a free spell that doubles all of your spells. Kind of disgusting. And so now we have that, but on Ember Cleave, which uh, if you didn't exist or didn't know or live through the Embercleave format when uh, the first Throne of Eldraine came out. Uh, it was disgusting. It was not fun. It would just, you know, you'd swing in with your, your whole board. Embercleave comes in for two mana, attaches itself immediately, and then you have double strike and trample on a creature. So this, um, yeah. While they said initially that this set was supposed to be balance, helped to balance standard and to give players this sort of like uh, all these reprints that were necessary and, and valuable reprints for commander for standard for all this stuff wow wow we wise the set just 
pushed as hell. <laughs> I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I think this card's a problem. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun to play in Commander. <laughs> That's for sure. But uh, this could be a card that somebody wants to play in something like Slicer, even. Right? Like, I guess it gives Slicer just Trample, because it already has Double Strike. But that's kind of the one thing that uh, you can stop. You know, if you're a creature based deck, you can sort of uh, push Slicer down the road is just if you can chump block it. And so maybe this is strong enough. Maybe this is worth the inclusion. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, for me, it's like, do you play this over some of the like Final Fantasy Ultimate weapons? Like they're probably going to be. Oh, right. Dude, I forgot yeah. that those were a mechanic in that game. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's also Coma, World Eater. Uh, if you didn't think the first Coma was strong enough, which I think this one might be a little bit weaker because it doesn't have the activated ability, but it's the same cost, seven mana, three, two green, and two blue. A legendary serpent that serpent that cannot be countered. It has Trample, Ward 4, Whenever Coma deals combat damage to a player, create four 3-3 three, three blue serpent creature tokens named Coma's Coil. It is an 8-12. Is an 8-12 for seven mana. That can't be countered. This at rare, by the way, this is insane. I've, <laughs> I've never, I'm telling you, I've never seen a rare this good before. <laughs> This is uh, what, <laughs> what are your initial thoughts on that flash? That's that's one wild card. Uh, I mean, yes, if you want to use your wild cards on arena on this, if you have some rare wild cards, you, you can definitely do that. Yeah, there's a lot of reanimation strategies happening in in standard at the moment with, you know, like things like Atraxa and Valgavoth. So you basically have to choose between like crazy overpowered card advantage, card advantage engines like Valgavoth or Atraxa, or do you reanimate a big eight twelve trample ward four beater that doesn't do anything until combat the following turn? Which sounds like a downside. In one v one, it's I don't know. It's this seems very strong. Um, but they did they did print a way to get rid of it in this set so board wipes are not very common when you're drafting but when they do come up they're incredibly valuable we have the new blasphemous edict uh, it is a five mana black sorcery that says you may pay a single black mana rather than paying the spells mana cost if there are 13 or more creatures on the battlefield each player sacrifices 13 creatures of their choice most of the time this is a board wipe. Um, it's sorcery speed. And I don't think this really has a place in CDH, but it is one of those really fun commander cards that will, it will be cast for one mana quite, quite often. I think um, it seems good. It seems like a really good card. Just not quite to the level that we want to see in CDH um, at the moment. Uh, there is one card here that I did mention before we started recording that I do think could be viable in something like Teyam, and that is Abyssal Harvester. One and two black, Demon Warlock, three two, that says you can tap it, exile target creature card from a graveyard that was put there this turn, create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a nightmare in addition to its other types, then exile all other nightmare tokens you control. So doubling up on an effect uh this will i mean the, the token that you create will enter with a vigilance counter as long as you control Tayom. and this uh yeah is basically a free Tayom activation in in some senses so uh, you can also activate it at instant speed when you, a creature an opponent controls dies so you there is upside that i can't foresee at the moment with this card it seems really good 
Hmm. The set, the set does seem powerful. It seems really, really strong. Yeah, I, I mean, it also just feels like a lore dump of like, hey, here's all the magic IP. Uh, that's It's going to be in standard. You always have access to magic IP in standard while uh, Fantastic Four and Final Fantasy and Crash Bandicoot rotate in. Yeah, yeah, this is like, this is everything that we've got left in the tank. Take it quick. Forget about yeah, it's just like a little core set to be like, hey, magic is still magic. Is it? <laughs> it's so here's the thing. And this will be my final thought on the uh, universes beyond like in- inclusion into standard is that what they've done and what magic has done over the last 30 plus years is has created a foundation for a game that you can basically plug anything into like strategy wise and as long as it meets the conditions of the game doesn't break or bend anything uh can be included so it is the perfect platform to create cards like spongebob that mechanically you know and personality wise would it be acceptable within like the rule set it was fun for a minute you know to see some like things like street fighter which were like very mechanically mechanically unique and fit the fit the bill like they were all like um you know like ryu was was really strong but not overpowered and then you had a few like blanca a really fun design like that was that was my thing with it was that street fighter was probably the best of them so far i don't know it, it's we're going to be doing a universes beyond Yu-Gi-Oh <laughs> thing soon and including that franchise in this because the company has lost its confidence in its own brand. Like I I just Aether drift. Yes, it is a form of Kaladesh, but it just does not have the same. We're coming into it. We're already previewing some of the cards and they just don't have the same feeling. It is a race across planes. The whole omen path, like story plot twist has just made for, this really messy, messy, messy um, Magic the Gathering IP thing. Like, they can just put, you know, we saw it with uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, where all of these characters can exist simultaneously on the plane at the same time for no reason, just to fit the story that they want to tell. And it overall doesn't make sense, right? Aether Drift is going to be very similar to that. Tarkir Dragonstorm. I very much imagine it's the same thing. Yeah. It's I, I'm I'm a little speechless on it. It's it's tough to say for sure without like <laughs> the oh how you say optimism is hard to come by when you see announcements like this. So Flash, final thoughts? Um, No, just like I, I really would like to figure out this tiny bones in your face situation. Yeah, I want to figure that out too. Magicon was really fun though. I will say that. It was a lot of fun. I, and I look forward to going to more Magicons this next year. Met some great people. Uh, Troy, if you're out there listening to this, great to meet you. Um, let's, uh, gather our thoughts and, uh, reconvene, uh, next week. How's that sound, Flash? I'm in. All right. Sweet. In the meantime, get your limitless pill, drink a couple Dr. P's, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring that bell for more notifications to please our Lord and Savior, Don Cheadle, LG Rhythm, and... Uh, make sure you find us on all major podcasting platforms where you can leave us a five-star review, make us look super duper cool. You can also support us on Patreon by becoming an official pepperhead for $3 a month. You can become an official pepperhead, get access to uh, each of our bi-weekly giveaways. And you can also become a cherry vanilla pepperhead like Will Rule, K Mr. K, UWP Quirt, Dmon82, Tommy Cipher. Jacob Hibbard, The Boogie Ghost, Pool Boy Barry, Draw for Turn, KB, and Jeremy. Thank you all for your support. You get two free entries into each of our bi-weekly giveaways. 
and we have Raven left hanging out in the Mock Stars Dr. Pepper Lounge with a mountain of limitless pills at their disposal. All right. Let's get the heck out of here, Flash. This is Mock Stars Podcast. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Now you guy gonna do. Now you guy gonna do. <laughs> <laughs>